In this video, I'm going to go over a small fraction of the unit atomic structure and also I'm going over the properties of cathode rays. Here you can see a snapshot of the chapter content and you can see which part I'm planning to go over. Now for many people, chemistry is a kind of a hard subject and they think it's filled with equation and calculation. But what exactly is chemistry? We call chemistry as the study of matter. If we really think about the universe, the whole universe is made with two components, energy and matter. Chemistry is the branch of science that study about matter. Now what exactly is matter? We define matter as anything that has mass and that occupies space. So there are two things, mass plus occupying space. Now in general communication, we use the terms mass and weight as in same uh, idea. But when we are doing sciences, mass and weight mean two different things. Mass is the amount of matter in a material. Weight is how the force of gravity act on this mass. To get a better idea about this mass and weight difference, we can take an example. We are putting a person inside a spacesuit. So he has a certain mass like uh, the material he is composed of. He has bones, flesh, blood and things in his gut. And let's say we pack this guy in the spacesuit and he has this amount of material which is 100 kilograms and on Earth, under the Earth's gravitational force, his weight is 980 newtons. Let's just assume we have these numbers. Next thing we do is immediately drop this guy on the moon. And since this guy is in a space suit, let's say he, he even if he sweat, even a single drop of sweat is not escaping out. It is also trapped inside his space suit. So the amount of material, about amount of substances are constant. It is not changing. So the mass, you can see the mass the numerical value of mass stays constant while the weight has changed and you know that the gravitational force on moon is like one sixth that of earth so if you divide 980 by 6 you will get this number now you see the mass the mass doesn't depend on the location. It is about the amount of material, but weight is how this amount of material feel the gravitational force. Now, matter, matter exists in three states, solids, liquid, and gases. And you know the basic differences between these three states solids they have a fixed volume and a shape liquids they have a fixed volume but uh, they don't have a fixed shape so they can take the shape of whatever the container and then gas they don't have a sh fixed shape or fixed volume and if we go deep into the structure or the particle level or molecular or atomic level of solids liquids gas we can see these particles are very tightly held together in a solid that is why solids are going to have a fixed volume and a fixed shape later in the syllabus at one point you will be learning about something called intermolecular forces these intermolecular forces can determine if something is going to be a solid liquid or gas stronger the intermolecular forces the substance can exist as a solid if we consider a liquid you can see in a liquid the particles are less tightly packed the particles have some freedom to move around that's why liquids can take the shape of the container and then when it comes to gases you can see the particles are much much free 
than any of the particles in solids or liquids. So the gases don't have a defined volume or shape. So at later point in the syllabus, you will be working on gas laws because gases don't have definite volume or shape. They can show very unusual properties compared to liquids or solids. So you can see how understanding what matter is going to help you understand chemistry better. Basically, chemistry is the study of matter. The only thing is that when we study it, we represent how it works through equations and calculations, maybe concepts and models. Now we know chemistry is a study of matter and also we know what matter is. Now the next question is what exactly this matter made of? The answer is in the periodic table. In the periodic table you can find about 118 elements but the reality is the matter around us is made of less than 118 elements. It's much lesser a number of elements that compose the matter around us. However, there is a great diversity in this matter around us. We may have uh, live, uh, live things, the animate and inanimate substances, and we can find solid, liquid, and gas substances in this matter. But anyways, all this stuff is made with less than 118 elements. Some elements in the periodic table don't really exist in nature. They are very unstable. So even though we have great uh, diversity, a uh, great variation in the properties of the matter around us, we now know everything is made with less than 118 uh, types of elements. So how can such a fewer number of elements create this kind of diversity? It's in the bonding nature, the combining ratios, the ratios these elements combine when they make substances and uh, the strengths of the bonds. So this is what we are going to look into uh, to learning chemistry in this A-level chemistry course. Here I'm showing you the summary of the evolution of atomic theory. I'm not going to discuss everything in this video, but I'm, I, I will be discussing a small fraction of this uh, summary. But before going into greater details, I want to clarify a word, a term. I want to make sure that you understand the word theory. Theory and law are very different things. When you read about the structure of atom, you will keep on coming up with this word atomic th theory, but you will never find a word as atomic law. A law tells us what happens and a theory tells us why it happens. So a law is more like a statement. Maybe uh, it's, it's an equation. It's a very simple statement, but a theory is more like an explanation. For example, uh, you might have heard of laws of gravity. With laws of gravity, you can tell that if you throw something, it should fall down. But let's say you're throwing a ball at someone. When you throw a ball, it will fall down, but it may not travel in a straight line. It may, it may travel in a parabolic trajectory. So we can, uh, the, the explanation we give to explain that parabolic trajectory, that can be a theory. So basically, a theory is a, some sort of a model we use to explain a certain behavior. When it comes for the atomic theory, there were many scientists who did different types of experiments and based on their observations, they try to give an uh, idea about what atom is, what the smallest unit of matter could be. Now the problem with theories is that there is 
always a possibility that our theory can go wrong. But laws are not like that. Scientific laws, they never change. So there are these rare, rare occasions where we can upgrade a theory into a law. If we can prove that our theories uh, will never go wrong under any circumstance, then there is this uh, very rare opportunity to upgrade our theory as a law. Now coming back to atomic theory, we still don't have atomic law. What we have is theories, models, models proposed by various scientists. In, in chemistry, we uh, keep on switching between the quantum model and Bohr model to explain certain things because one model cannot explain everything. So as you advance in chemistry, you will come across many other different types of models to exp explain certain uh, properties of matter. So when you try to explain things, you it is very important you know which model you are using. If you are using the wrong model, you will not be able to explain the asked phenomenon or the described observation cannot be explained if you use the wrong model. So this is the point I want to bring. I wanted to bring your attention. Now let's look into early ideas about matter. As early as 440 BC, the philosopher Empedocles proposed that all things are made of fire, water, earth, and air. Later, another philosopher named Democritus proposed that the matter is made out of tiny, invisible, and indivisible particles. The term indivisible in Greek means atomos. So that is how we came up with this word atom. Uh, it, it derived from Greek word atomos. So the word atom basically means indivisible. It cannot be divided anymore. Now these people are philosophers. They are not scientists. They didn't do any scientific experiments. They were observing uh, the nature, things around them, and they, they proposed their opinion about it. After Democritus, there were few other philosophers like Plato and Aristotle that opposed Democritus' opinion about matter, the particle nature or the indivisible invisible particle. So the philosophers like Plato and Aristotle said that there cannot be such kind of an indivisible particle. And you know what? People believed it because Plato, Aristotle, they were great philosophers. Now you might be wondering if you are required to remember these history stories. Yes, of course, you need to remember these uh, names and what kind of ideas the philosophers proposed because that is going to be sometimes a part in your multiple choice questions. Now in the known history, the next person to bring an idea about the smallest unit of matter is John Dalton. After Aristotle and Plato opposed Democritus' idea about the indivisible particle, people actually believed it and it is in the 17th century that people finally started coming up with more ideas about smallest unit of matter. There are several points in this uh, theory proposed by John Dalton. We call them as the postulates of Dalton's atomic theory. So the first postulate is that elements are made out of extremely small indivisible particles called atoms. So he was kind of going back into what Democritus said. John Dalton is an Englishman. He was a school teacher. Now this is a person who actually did some basic experiments. Back then, bringing back this idea about indivisible particle was a giant step in the evolution of the uh, atomic theory. However, by now we know that there are subatomic particles such as electrons, protons and neutrons 
so some of these Dalton's postulates can go wrong as I said earlier things like theories they can go wrong Dalton's second postulate state that all atoms of a given element are identical in mass and size however that the atoms of different elements can be different what does this mean if we take an example let's take copper as an example according to what he says all atoms in copper is same the first copper atom is uh, similar uh, i mean identical in mass and size to the second copper atom that are, that is what he is saying and in the second uh, part of this statement says that different elements are going to be different if we take another example gold we can say that the uh, gold atoms are all same the first gold atom is identical in mass and size to the second gold atom however if you compare a copper atom with a gold atom now that's different that is what the second part of this statement say if you take two different uh, atoms they are going to be different however by now we know a thing called isotopes isotopes are atoms of the same element but they may have different masses so we know that his second postulate has also gone bit wrong for example you may know about the isotopes of carbon there is c12 c13 c14 they're all carbon atoms but they have different masses Dalton's third postulate state that atoms can neither be created nor destroyed when a chemical reaction take place so when we have a chemical reaction what we start with are the same elements that we end up with for example we are combining carbon and oxygen together these are our reactants and on the other side we have the products which contain the same elements we use so that is what he says atoms are neither reacted nor uh, neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction so in other words let's say if you write an equation like that this you combine carbon and oxygen and on the other side you find something like this that is not used now here i'm showing you use carbon but suddenly carbon change into hydrogen so things like this don't happen that's what he said atoms are neither created nor destroyed when a crea chemical reaction take place in his third postulate dalton states that when a compound is made two or more atoms of different elements combine in simple numerical ratio for example we'll take combining carbon and oxygen again when carbon and oxygen combine here we see the product carbon dioxide and you can see in carbon dioxide carbon to oxygen ratio is 1 to 2 so the atoms of different elements combined in simple numerical ratio we can take another example combining carbon and oxygen i'm not writing balance equation i'm just showing the ratios so in in here i'm showing you carbon and oxygen combining to make carbon monoxide in here you can see that carbon to oxygen ratio is going to be one to one however nowadays we can synthesize uh, many compounds with very different uh, element ratios it is not going to be as simple as uh, dalton states even in nature sometimes we can find very complex molecules so things are not going to be this simple uh, in nowadays the next important name we come across is johnston stoney he named the fundamental unit of electricity as the electron however he did not have any experimental evidences to prove the existence of it 
Now it's very important to remember that this scientist is not credited for finding the electron. He is not the one who is credited for finding the electron. It's someone else. What Johnston Stoney is credited for is naming the fundamental unit of electricity as the electron. The person who is credited for finding the electron is J.J. Thompson. So we are going to look into his findings much later. Now let's look into the cathode ray tube experiment, which is also called as the Crookes tube experiment in honor of Sir William Crookes. In your school, you will be doing this experiment. You might have a cathode ray tube like the one I have shown here, or your cathode ray tube might be slightly different from this one. In this experiment, he used a tube where a low pressure is maintained and he connected two plates to a high voltage source. The plate connected to the negative end is the cathode and the plate connected to the positive end is the anode. When this high voltage was given, he observed some rays emitted from the cathode. Since these beams were emitted from the cathode, those radiation is called as the cathode rays. He also observed that when he placed an object in front of these rays, that it creates a shadow. Now, William Crookes was not the only person who was doing these kind of experiments. Many other people were playing around with electricity and used this kind of cathode ray tubes doing uh, different variations of this experiment, which we are going to look into now. Here you can see a cathode ray tube. Uh, this is going to be connected to the high voltage supply and then you can see the cathode ray emitting. Now the electrons, they actually don't have a color. So how come you see a green color? This is because when the, the electron travel from the cathode, they hit the gases that is inside the tube. And when the electrons hit the gas atoms, there are certain electron excitations and de-excitations. That's what caused that color. Now you can see an object is placed in front of the path. And when we uh, provide the high voltage again, you can see how it generate a shadow. Now what is your observation in this part? You can see that when you place an object in front of the path of the cathode rays, it generates a shadow with sharp edges. What can you conclude with this observation? You can say that the cathode rays travel in a straight line. In this part, we are going to test these cathode rays in the presence of a provided electric charge. Now here you can see two plates here. When there is no charge, there is no deflection in the beam, but when a positive charge is given to this upper plate, you can see the cathode rays are going to deflect towards the positively charged plate. Now you know similar charges repel and the opposite charges they attract. If something attract towards a positive charge, then that something should be negatively charged. So from this part of the experiment, you can say, uh, you can observe that the cathode rays deflect towards the positively charged plate. So you can conclude that your cathode rays are composed of negatively charged particles or the cathode rays are negatively charged. Next, we are going to look, look into a slightly different cathode ray tube where there is a light paddle wheel uh, inside this tube. 
when the uh, the voltage supply is given and the cathode rays are emitted you can see that this paddle wheel move and there is an inverter we can switch the cathode and anode time to time so you can see when the cathode rays hit this paddle wheel it start moving so observation is that the blades of the paddle wheel they rotate that is our observation and we can draw a conclusion that the cathode rays have momentum the cathode rays are composed of particles that has a mass and they have a kinetic energy here we are going to see how cathode rays are going to behave in the presence of a magnetic field you can see that when we hold the north end of the magnet the cathode rays deflect in a perpendicular direction and the uh, south end is provided the cathode rays deflect in the opposite direction but perpendicular what if we give a parallel magnetic field you see that this cathode ray is not going to deflect so the observation of this part of the experiment is that when we provide a magnetic field the cathode rays deflect in the same way that a negative charge would behave so the observation is the direction of the deflection is similar to the deflection of a negatively charged particle so what is our inference that the cathode rays are composed of negatively charged particles i think you can recall that when we provided a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate the cathode rays deflected towards the positively charged plate so the deflection was towards the positively charged plate but when we did the experiment in the magnetic field the deflection was not towards the magnet it was towards a perpendicular direction not towards the magnet what i'm going to show here is not necessary for you to know it is just for your curiosity sake that i'm explaining this otherwise this is more like a physics concept but for anyone who is wondering why this uh, cathode ray deflected in that kind of a direction in the presence of a magnetic field this is why now here i'm showing you a cathode ray tube and i'm holding a magnet and you know how this magnet provide the magnetic field this is the direction of our magnetic field and the green arrow shows you the direction cathode rays move now this is the cathode ray is actually negatively charged particle moving now there's a special thing happen when charged particles move in the magnetic field when this charged particle move in the direction the green arrow shows there is a certain velocity in this direction of the green arrow now when a particle move a charged particle when a charged particle move in the presence of a magnetic field it can generate a magnetic force so at the end the magnetic field the velocity and the magnetic force are going to be in perpendicular direction here i'm taking a positive charge if my positive charge is moving in the direction of the green arrow this is the direction of my velocity and the red arrow shows the magnetic field which is perpendicular to the velocity and then if this positive charge is moving in the direction of this green arrow for the positive charge i will get a magnetic field as shown is the as shown in this blue arrow since our cathode rays are negatively charged what happens when we move a negative charge in a magnetic field is that our magnetic force is in the opposite direction you can see here i'm keeping the direction of my velocity the same and i'm keeping the direction of my magnetic field 
the same but for a negative charge the magnetic force is going to be uh, in the opposite direction compared to the positive charge so what happened is what you observed in the experiment your cathode rays are going to tilt uh, deflect in a direction perpendicular to the the magnetic field now you are not required to know this physics concept all you need to know is that in the presence of a magnetic field uh, these cathode rays behave as uh, how how a negative part negatively charged particle would behave that is what you are required to know not this physics concept in the experiment with the magnet you saw that when you switch the north and south side of the magnet the the cathode rays deflected in the other direction so when you tilt your magnet you when you switch the north and south ends the magnetic field direction change like this so what happened is you keep the direction of the velocity in the same direction as in the green line green arrow but the direction of your magnetic field now change now you can see which side your magnetic force is going so your magnetic force goes in the other direction so that is what you observed in the experiment when you provide the south end of the magnet the cathode ray deflect in the other direction which is perpendicular to the magnetic field here i have provided a summary of the properties of the cathode rays you know that cathode rays they travel in a straight line and the cathode rays have a certain momentum they have they are made out of particles with certain masses and they have a kinetic energy and cathode rays are composed of negatively charged particles now i mentioned many other people did different types of experiments with these cathode ray tubes and it was observed that no matter what type of gas you inside the tube or what kind of material used to make the cathode uh, no matter what he used the nature of the cathode rays never changed so the nature of the cathode rays did not depend on the nature of the gas inside the tube or the nature of the cathode material additionally from other experiments it was observed that the ratio of the cha charge to mass the em ratio we call this as the em ratio the em ratio observed for different types of gases were found to be same so no matter what type of gas you had inside that tube be it oxygen or nitrogen or argon whatever the gas there was the em ratio observed for cathode rays was the same ratio